Welcome to EPG Patshala. This paper is the philosophy of law. The current module is entitled Violence Against Women, Why Intersectionality Matters. The objectives of this module are to attempt to understand violence against women in terms of the concept of intersectionality. This module was written by Uma Kant, an independent research scholar in New Delhi. I'm Akash Singh Rator from the Lewis University of Rome. Violence against women has been steadily increasing in the country. The number of cases reported uh, in police stations across the country have grown to such a high proportion that one rape case is now reported on average every 20 minutes. If we look back at 1971, which is the first year that um, the reported cases are available, there were approximately 2,500 cases of rape reported. If we look at 2013, which are the latest figures that we have that are completely accounted for, there are more than 33,700 cases of rape uh, registered. It's unclear whether there's been an absolute uh, increase in the total number of uh, uh, crimes perpetrated or if the um, system of registration has allowed us to see more and more visibly how much crime is, is, is perpetrated. But the, the point is that at the present moment the um, violence against women is at a remarkably uh, high uh, point. Now there are equally disturbing figures of other kinds of violence against women, so not simply rape. The other kinds of violence against women are also reported um, and what we find is that when we, when we look at the data of those other kinds of crimes, we have a uh, current system in place where on a daily basis the dignity of women and even the dignity and life of uh, girl children is violated um, by the minute uh, in this country. So we need to attempt to understand this phenomenon so that we can uh, adequately begin to address it. Now I'm going to discuss uh, a, a few pieces of data from violence against women. Before I do, you should keep in mind that women suffer crime and criminality just as, uh, as much as men. So in other words, we have general crimes such as murder or, or theft and um, these uh, are, are not gender specific. However, on top of this, we have gender specific uh, crimes. So uh, rape is the most salient one, but it is certainly not the only one. Under the Indian Penal Code, there are at least seven other kinds of crimes against women that are specified. Some of them are, for example, the prohibition on the importation of women for uh, s slavery or, or other kinds of exploitation. In addition to the prohibition on importation of women, there are also specific prohibitions on um, murder or uh, threats with relation to dowry, resulting in dowry deaths, and also prohibitions on um, uh, aggression with the intent to insult the modesty of uh, women. So within the IPC, you have a number of alternative uh, uh, crimes that can be uh, perpetrated against uh, women specifically in addition to rape. There are also special and local uh, laws, referred to as SLL, that address um, crimes against women specifically. So, uh, for example, in Andhra Pradesh, you have a prohibition against the Devdasi uh, system, which is uh, another um, uh, way of understanding uh, crime against women. We'll probably uh, uh, use the Devdasi system as an example later in this, in this module. So we see that rape is perhaps the most salient example of a crime against women and that crimes against women are those compounded in addition to crimes that women just happen to suffer because uh, all people suffer these crimes such as murder and theft. Um, um, now let's look at some statistics. In the year 2012 there were two and a half lakh uh, crimes reported under the IPC. So these crimes that I had mentioned, such as dowry death and um, importation of women and rape, there were two and a half lakhs reported in 2012 and more than three lakhs reported in 2013. So what is the breakdown of this? 
Andhra Pradesh reported 10% of total such cases in the country. Delhi reports the highest crime rate uh, in the nation. The total number of uh, reported cases under the IPC has increased over the last five years from 9% of the total number of cases reported up to more than 11% uh, in 2013. Of all of these, Madhya Pradesh reports the highest number of rape cases in the country, more than uh, 4,300 in the year uh, 2013 alone. Assaults on women uh, with the attempt to outrage their modesty, which again is another act of um, criminality against women specifically, has 8,200 uh, cases reported. In West Bengal, of course, we have the highest number of the cases of uh, trafficking uh, girls or importing uh, foreign women or girls with the intent to exploit them. So we see on the one hand an increase in overall criminal activity uh, with respect to crimes against women as defined in the IPC and we also see certain trends in certain areas of the country representing that there are uh, problem, problematic zones for specific kinds of criminal acts. Another example of this is that the highest uh, case of reporting dowry deaths uh, is in the uh, UP where there were 30% um, of all of the dowry deaths in India uh, took place in the year 2013. As we discussed in the module on understanding consent, the data up to 2013 shows that more than 94% uh, of the assailants in rape cases were known to the rape victims. In that module, the figure 98% was used. Obviously, the range falls somewhere within there, and uh, the point is that the number of attacks that occur are by and large done by uh, people who are trusted by the, by the victim. A total of 53,000 cases of crimes against women were reported in the 50 megacities um, in India out of 3 lakh total cases reported in the country in 2013. What that suggests is that almost as much as 70% of the crimes against women that occur in this country occur in the uh, uh, urban areas as opposed to 30% or so that occurs in the rural areas. Now, in these urban areas, Delhi, the, the uh, city, accounts for more than 21% of the total crimes against women in this country, followed secondly by Mumbai with only 5.5%. I say only in relation to Delhi's 21%. So there's a, a radical drop uh, of crimes against women um, after uh, the, 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 the highest uh, city in Delhi. In other words, Delhi is four times as violent against women as, uh, as Mumbai. This is a, something of a shocking figure. Nevertheless, let's keep in mind that even the fact that 8,000 uh, cases of crimes against women are reported in Mumbai uh, just in the year 2013, even cities like Mumbai, Bangalore, Ahmedabad have very high rates of, of uh, crime and criminality targeted specifically against women, and remember that this is in addition to other crimes like murder or theft that just happen to have happened to uh, women. These are not counted. We're counting only crimes against uh, women specifically targeted at, uh, towards their gender. Now, this is why um, the concept of intersectionality needs to be introduced. So after looking at the um, quite a sad state of affairs, how much crime there is against women throughout the country, which states are um, uh, salient for which kinds of crimes. What do we do with this sort of data? This is just a, a, a great deal of, of data that um, tell us that there's a great deal of crime. We need a theoretical tool in order to understand how to cope with this, um, uh, with this phenomenon about crime against women. Sharmila Rege, in the year 2013, published a very influential article uh, referred, referring to the concept of intersectionality. What intersectionality does is it tells us that if we're going to address uh, crimes against women, we're going to need to employ an intersectional approach. While uh, women are the more vulnerable gender between uh, uh, male and female, even within 
that vulnerability, you have the intersection of caste and class with this primary vulnerability of gender. So in other words, if we were to go back and look at all of that data, while we've accumulated that data as crimes against women as such, if we were to look more carefully at it, what we would find is the data can itself be broken down when we keep in mind that there are crimes against women as such, just as there are crimes as such, like murder and theft, but these crimes are disproportionately targeting vulnerable uh, uh, sections of the female population, specifically Dalits, uh, Adivasis, and people from uh, religious minorities and, uh, and uh, lower classes. So in addition to this concept of crimes against women, which we need in order to take steps to prevent crimes against women, unless we are sensitive to the notion of intersectionality, it would be impossible for us to address the nature of these um, crimes. Because in many cases, these are simply crimes, crimes that are performed. So for example, a murder or a theft. The, uh, the thief doesn't care if he's robbing a male or a female. He's just engaged in the act of robbing. In many cases, these are acts of uh, crimes against women. Someone is uh, uh, molesting a uh, female because the person is a female. But in a, 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 a deeply disproportionate amount of these crimes, what we find out is that the person isn't targeted just as a person and that uh, the woman isn't targeted just as a woman. Rather, the person who is targeted, who happens to be a woman, is a Dalit woman or is a tribal woman. And that was the specific target of the crime. Without intersectionality, we would not know how to cope with crimes against women since crimes against women aren't uh, perpetuated against some vague idea of the feminine or the female. They're targeted specifically against people who are doubly or triply vulnerable based on their gender and also their caste and class. As I had mentioned, in conceptualizing feminist theories for understanding gender issues in a broader perspective, scholars like Sharmila Vege and others have opined that developments that can be traced from the 1990s, or more specifically, the new visibility and depth of Ambedkar scholarship following the birth centenary celebrations of Ambedkar. The secular resurgence of caste in the public sphere, the implementation of the Mandel Com Commission report, the renewed assertion of Dalit feminism at national and regional levels, the addressal of caste at the UN Conference Against Racism at Durban, all posed serious challenges to the theory of gender in India. Dalit feminism has problematized the historically constituted opposition between the rights of women and those of the so-called backward castes and minorities. This has wedged open diverse and divergent histories of anti-caste feminisms in India, thus drawing attention to the disjuncture between academic knowledge and the social practices of caste. What we understand by Rege's work is that while the uh, increase of violence against women has triggered the activities of a great deal of, um, uh, of feminism in civil society, the feminism in civil society in India can be criticized from the specific vantage point of Dalit feminism. So just as uh, post-colonial feminists or feminists in India, such as uh, uh, Vandana Shiva, uh, Gayatri Spivak, or Ratna Kapoor, have critiqued uh, first world feminism for its inability to understand feminism at the margins or the way that uh, feminism should be uh, uh, theorized within countries like India, that same gesture that um, higher class or higher caste feminists in India have affected with respect to first world feminists. Dalit feminists like Sharmila Rege are now engaged against Indian feminists like Gayatri Spivak, uh, Ratna Kapoor or, or uh, Vandana Shiva. So this is a very uh, uh, promising way in which the concept of intersectionality can be introduced 
into the discourse with respect to crimes against women because the discourse at the level of civil society and academic scholarship with respect to crimes against women has promoted a sort of um, uh, feminist uh, movement. But is that feminist movement sensitive to intersectionality? Uh, Rege suggested that uh, it needs to become more and more sensitive to intersectionality if feminism in India is going to be um, uh, the adequate tool to uh, theorize and address the possibility for coping with the increased presence of violence against women in India. Now there are empirical reasons to support this concept of intersectionality and to see that it is a very valid um, uh, idea that needs to be introduced into Indian feminism. Dalit women, Dalit women continue facing harassment, violence, and uh, the violation of their human rights all across the country. Even if we focus on just the last two decades, it remains uh, deeply distressing, uh, despite the fact that the last uh, uh, two decades have been those where the problems that uh, Dalits and Adivasis face have come out most prominently in the public sphere. In the module on understanding consent, we have already discussed the uh, Manwari Devi case in Rajasthan, and there are several such cases um, in uh, Bihar, in Maharashtra, in several places in Haryana, Punjab, UP, MP, AP, Tamil Nadu, and other states as well. What is happening in all of these cases is that rape and other kinds of violence is targeted specifically to Dalit women, not just women, but Dalit women, and that these cases continue to go unreported due to the vulnerability of that sector, or they go um, uninvestigated due to the insensitivity of the predominantly higher caste uh, castes who constitute the police force in those areas. From the year 1990 to 2013, which is the last year where we have complete data, 30,000 cases of rape against Dalit women specifically have been registered with the police countrywide. So if you take the total number of, uh, of figures of rape registered against women in India, you see that the cases registered against Dalit women specifically is way out of proportion to their the, the amount of population that, uh, that they represent. Dalit women are about 15% of the total population, whereas this 30,000 cases of rape suggest that they are uh, well uh, over the average of 50% in terms of rape cases. Now let's attempt to understand this um, more comprehensively. Violence or atrocities against Dalit women is systemic and structural. It occurs at at least three distinct levels. So the tool of intersectionality introduces three distinct levels that we can use to cope with the data where it's clear that Dalit women suffer most of the, uh, the majority of the atrocities um, uh, that are committed against women. At the first level, violence, you must understand, is already an inherent part of the caste system. So since caste norms are uh, enforced through various modes of violence, either actively or passively. In other words, um, either uh, physical brutal violence or in uh, prevention of Dalits from accessing resources like water or um, uh, enjoying uh, equal uh, rights to uh, enter temples, to, to um, go to the polling stations, things like that. Violence is always systemically pres present within caste itself. So at one level, we have to realize the systemic violence that's there in the notion of caste. A recent study on violence against Dalit women, which is based on the interview of 500 Dalit women and girl children survivors of violence between 1999 and 2004 across AP, Bihar, Tamil Nadu, and UP, has revealed a range of causal factors for violence in the general community directly attribu attributable to systematic caste, gender, violence. In other words, since violence is already implicit in the caste system, the, in, the, the data uh, gleaned from 500 interviews shows that the more vulnerable within the caste, which happens to be uh, uh, the female as the more vulnerable gender, suffer the consequences 
um, very profoundly of the violence that's already inherent in the caste system. So everybody um, from the uh, outcast community suffers violence just because of the nature of the caste system. But those who are more vulnerable naturally suffer more violence. And the women within that community are the more vulnerable as the um, data about violence of women simply attests to in general. Now, rapes and uh, other kinds of sexual assaults are higher amongst those Dalit women who have a high poverty rate and who work in the unorganized uh, sectors. So um, the unorganized sectors are the unregulated sectors, the, the, the gray market as, as it's sometimes referred to, and the number of rapes that occur against Dalit women are higher in that sector than in the organized sector. So that introduces yet a third element into the mix. We have already the gender uh, issue, which is that women are more likely subject to violence in this country. We have the caste issue, which is that Dalit women are more likely the objects of violence in this country. And now we see that there's also a class uh, uh, element involved too, since it's those Dalit women who are deeply impoverished or employed in the unorganized sector who suffer the greatest number of violence. So we're talking about gender, caste, and class as being causal to the um, the uh, uh, high proportion of, of violent crimes uh, against women. Now let's move to the second level. Dalit women are more subject to punitive violence, that is violence meted out in order to punish, because they're perceived to be those who transgress the caste norms. Now we've talked about the case in Rajasthan at length in the other module, but Violence against women is meted out all over the country in cases where there is caste endogamy, where untouchability norms are transgressed, or where particular Dalit women uh, assert their rights over uh, common spaces, public spaces, public um, uh, uh, institutions, uh, and cultural spaces. In other words, when Dalit women uh, try to draw water from the well that is, is uh, supposed to be um, uh, remain pure uh, from their uh, polluting touch, or when they try to enter the central marketplace of the village where they're um, not allowed to, to go, or when they try to enter, enter the temple, they often face aggression and specifically rape as a punitive measure to uh, ensure that people d uh, other Dalit women don't get the idea that they can um, try to enter the public sphere in this, um, in this radical manner. So um, we've discussed the large number of rapes that occur in the country against women, but as we explore more deeply, what we find is that many of these rapes are not originating in these other kinds of ideas that were perpetuated in theories about the cause of rape, such as sexual frustration, what we find is that intersectionality opens up the possibility for us to see that why so many Dalit uh, women are raped is uh, uh, causally um, uh, determined by rape as a punitive device for the transgression of caste norms. At a third level, we see that Dalit women face compounded violence. So this is the third kind of violence um, that is specifically subject uh, to Dalit women. We have the violence implicit and inherent in caste as such. We have the violence that is um, punitive violence. And at this third level, we have compounded violence. What do we mean by compounded violence? Well. The female Dalit is subject to the kind of violence from the higher caste, male and female. In other words, in many cases of um, labor uh, abuse that results to, um, to servants, uh, cooks, uh, cleaners, sweepers, a lot of the abuse that uh, Dalit women uh, suffer is meted out not by high caste men, but by high caste women. So uh, uh, in, uh, in, in 
just to use one example, uh, housewives in uh, middle class uh, homes taking out their frustration on their uh, Dalit uh, uh, sweeper for, for the sweeper not having um, done a, a job uh, adequate to their uh, liking or asking for more money or something like this. So there are numerous cases reported where a Dalit female is beaten by a high caste female. Now, uh, this adds or compounds onto what we have been talking about because the cases of violence against women that have all been reported have been cases reported of men against women. But here we have a clear uh, set of cases of violence of upper caste women against outcast women. And these are cases that are not even uh, routinely reported. This is a compound violence because that suggests that the Dalit woman suffers uh, on, a, on account of her caste violence from higher caste women. She suffers on account of her gender violence from uh, her own uh, caste or community. In other words, it's clear that um, we still live in a, in, a, in a dominantly patriarchal society and Dalit men enjoy the privilege of patriarchy just as much as high caste men. So if a Dalit man commits violence against his uh, wife, it's not because she's a Dalit, it's because she's uh, a female and more vulnerable as such. So we see compounded violence. The Dalit female can suffer violence from her spouse or her kin on account of her gender. She can suffer violence from a high caste female on account of her caste. And she can suffer violence and routinely does from higher caste males on account of the fact that she transgresses cultural norms, that she is a woman, that she is a Dalit, that she is low class. So the intersectionality approach allows us to look more clearly at the data and see the nuances and subtleties of exactly what is hidden by those numbers when we say violence against women. What kind of woman, why, when, in what circumstances. So when we have intersectionality, we need to uh, supplement feminist activity that says violence against uh, uh, females must stop. We need to supplement that with an, uh, a clear understanding of which females uh, suffer the most amount of violence and by whom. What the aforementioned data suggests is that government hasn't taken adequately into account not only general measures to prevent violence against women, but how could they when they haven't taken into account intersectionality at all? If the largest number or, or, or uh, of, of violent acts is meted out to a specific community who is not merely uh, female, but female end of a specific class, end of a specific uh, caste or uh, community, such as Dalit, Adivasi, uh, Christian, uh, uh, Muslim, uh, or other uh, minority, then how can adequate steps even begin to be taken in addressing the overall concept of violence against women. If you don't know the cause or explore the specifics, how can you address the, um, the general problem? Another issue that's thrown out by the problems of reporting cases and the issue of intersectionality is that when it comes to Dalit women's rights uh, uh, to be protected by the law and legal remedies for violence, there are such deeply ingrained normative values of uh, caste uh, uh, discrimination, uh, gender discrimination, class discrimination that are built in to the legal system itself. So the clear case of this is the high number of Dalit women who go to police uh, stations to report rapes who are in turn raped by the police to whom they're uh, reporting. The complicity of non-state and state structures in perpetuation of violence against Dalits in general and Dalit women in particular has further created a regime of total impunity and lack of accountability. And this is perhaps how we can best explain the burgeoning numbers of violence against women in this country. Thank you.